Thank you. Well, we have a, both a fascinating subject and a, an incredibly uh, good panel uh, to address it, coming from um, a, a very number of, a number of distinctive perspectives. Um, and I know we also have a lot of expertise uh, in the room, which we want to draw on as well, make this uh, a, a pretty interactive uh, panel. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think we'll sort of go to and fro with the room and the, and the panelists. You know, The Economist was founded in 1843 to champion the cause of free trade. We were against the protectionist corn laws. Uh, and it's pretty extraordinary that nearly 175 years on, uh, we're still fighting the good fight. So that's one of our subjects uh, today, is what is the state of play uh, with free trade uh, and the threats to it? Not just Trump, but perhaps others as well will explore. And what is the impact potentially of that, if any in indeed, on, on shipping? Um, the link between trade and shipping is something that is, uh, and, and between GDP and, and uh, sh shipping is very much uh, something that you'll all be familiar with. Uh, but the, there's a question about how strong it remains because of changes perhaps in the way that GDP uh, is being uh, generated these days. Uh, certainly in container shipping, it used to be held that a, a one percentage point increase in, uh, in GDP would lead to uh, a two to three percentage point uh, increase in, um, in, in container shipping. But I'm told by uh, the ICS that we're now talking in terms of fractions rather than multiples in terms of the, the link. So that's, a, that's a, quite a mind-concentrating change. But then there are all sorts of other changes to the environment going on that affect uh, uh, both trade and shipping, and those are ones we want to explore. Uh, there's, of course, the rise of China, very, very important player. So it's not just developments in the United States, it's, it's, the, it's the developments in China, the shift in the way that GDP is moving because of technology, shift in usage of raw materials, uh, the effect, the impact of technology on the industry, consolidation within the industry uh, having a huge, uh, a huge effect. So all these are questions we want to explore uh, today. And if I could start with you, Jan, uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about this macro question because it's something that you um, that you look at at Dunk Tad. I, I know you're you're keen to tell us that Dunk Tad stands for free trade these days, no, not 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 a uh, in favour of protectionism. But uh, you 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 are very acutely aware, perhaps, of the the really global nature of of the industry and the the forces that drive it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Danny. And, and yes, I said I, I have to get this across. Uh, some of you with more gray hair or less hair will <laughs> associate UNCTAD very much with some old protectionist idea of 40, 40, 20 and uh, cargoization regimes. And, and that was in, in old times, whether it was right or wrong at that time, with the idea to help uh, emerging economies to participate in, in that business. And as we all know, it didn't, doesn't work, this quota in, in market share. And on the contrary, today, we very much work on and promote and study and advise uh, that, in fact, liberalization of d different maritime businesses is good for emerging developing countries. Uh, without the, uh, you no longer have maritime countries and non-maritime, you have uh, Philippine seafarers, Bangladesh scrapping, uh, uh, Dubai port operators, China shipbuilding, uh, and you have all the different um, uh, countries participating in parts of the business, uh, flag of Panama, and so on and so forth. So that's something which uh, we now have really reversed, and we say talking about trade and shipping. Yes, uh, liberalizing different shipping businesses is mm -hmm. good for development. So that's the first key point which uh, I guess I'm preaching to the converted, but I, I think a lot of the data we have confirms this very much. In fact, uh, the second point I want to make is uh, the main, oh, not the main, but very often the main obstacle to trade is not so much a tariff or a quota, but it's trade efficiency. So a lot of our work these days looks at trade facilitation, trade efficiency, customs modernization, shipping connectivity, transit regimes, port modernization, port privatization, uh, uh, so it is really not so, uh, not so much how much duty do you pay, that's a classical liberalization, but it is the cost of moving goods, which we could have had more time linked to the previous session, uh, maybe we have some time later on. So uh, a third on, and, and last point then in that context, so protectionism 
is bad. I think we, we agreed on this also before we, we sat here. Uh, it refers to trade in goods. Uh, there it's, it's bad for development. And also trade, uh, liber not uh, limiting trade and shipping services, we also believe is, is not a good thing. And, and um, I believe there are quite a few, um, uh, and, and we were asked to, to have some Pro potentially provocative, no? Uh, Brexit well, was not mentioned the whole morning. Mm. <coughs> um, uh, my three sons are living and studying and working in the UK. I'm very pro-UK. and uh, So we have read in the press that the United Kingdom wants to double its tonnage under the United Kingdom flag. And maybe we have time to discuss this. I believe it will be more, more difficult to do so outside the EU because you will no longer have access to the EU cabotage market. That's, I'm throwing back a question to the question no, you asked. Well, absolutely Thank fascinating to, to, I think Brexit is, is absolutely a, uh, a, a, a topic that we should explore. But I, I'm curious that you, you, put, you put this broader framework uh, in, in the, uh, of what really matters. Are, are you saying that, uh, I, I suppose, trying to get a sense of balance, how worried or otherwise relaxed should we be about current direction of, of US policy? Is, is it really not going to have all that much impact when it comes down to it? And all these other mm -hmm. factors are mm -hmm. going to end up being uh, yeah. perhaps more important. Yeah. I, I put that as a question, I'm not saying. Yeah, yeah no, thanks. Um, so, so far, I think we actually have to give a lot of credit also to the World Trade Organization, where all members, including the US, have so far refrained from a major protectionist uh, approach. Yes, there are individual policies, uh, Jones Act and the ideas of, of uh, cancelling bilateral trade agreements, but I, my, it's a really a more personal thought here. We, we all agree, and, and UNCTAD experts, World Bank experts, WTO experts, it is not good to do this, but so far the impact has not been quite as bad as we might have feared. That's my impression. So, Andreas, you're the, the, a diplomat uh, among us. Do you, is this because you're doing your job so well that actually all these... If we keep ourselves occupied? Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, no, I would, say, I would say actually that I do have some concerns. Uh, and I will say initially that when, when, we, when we say free trade in a maritime perspective, I think that there are sort of two dimensions we should remember. One is that uh, free trade in terms of uh, selling and buying goods, uh, because without goods that has to be moved, there will be no shipping. So, so sort of in that way, shipping is absolutely uh, interlinked. It's the backbone of, of, of trade as such. So we are depending on world trade as such, and that there, there will be free flow of, uh, of, of goods. Uh, but there's also the other dimension, and that is sort of free trade of maritime services. Mm -hmm. And that means uh, we need to have fair competition, we need to have market access. Um, and I, in, both, in both perspectives, I, I have some concerns. First of all, I would say that uh, on the one side, uh, Jan was mentioning some that uh, now there are benefits for Philippines and everyone, that's true. But the fact of the matter is that many countries now have realized that maritime activities can actually be a very, very important driver for economic growth. So many uh, governments around are now focusing, uh, making strategies for how can we be a stronger uh, maritime nation. That's on the one side positive. But the, the concerning part is that we also see an increasing what I would call economic nationalism. Uh, the most famous one is uh, America first, but we actually see tendencies around. So if you start to combine this, a wish for becoming a big maritime nation, a player in the, in, in the market, combine that with economic nationalism, that is a driver for cargo reservation, uh, protectionism in, in, in many ways that will hamper trade. The other uh, uh, thing that, that the other concern, major concern I have is that we should remember that protectionism actually comes in many, many forms. And I know that the, the morning session, there was a lot of discussions on enforcement and uh, on ballast water and other things, enforcement, uh, the cost of implementation, etc. And I see a picture now that we are in a time where we are introducing uh, new regulation and we will also see new regulation come into play in the, in the, in the coming decades uh, with an environmental focus. But they will all sort of be a possible vehicle for uh, diverse uh, implementation. Some countries will be easier off. Uh, we will have uh, also regional uh, regions 
that sort of will maybe uh, put the bar a little bit higher. So there will be a lot of mechanisms to distort. And my concern here is that one thing is it will be very difficult for the market, for the shipping market, to react in, 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 in a market where the, where the demands are different. But it also opens the, the, the door to the path where we're starting to have different kinds of regulation. Yeah. And that's really a concern. So is there an analogy here with the, with the food industry? It's always, you know, sanitary... Uh, of uh, uh, regulations or safety regulations are often um, uh, used or seem to be used as a, uh, as a as a cloak for protectionist measures, and you fear something of the same yes, for environmentalist yes, yes, regulation yes, in shipping, and yes, it would become hard to. Yes, yes. Can I ask you also? I mean, if you were to design a bit of America first legislation. <laughs> um, <laughs> You might actually come up with nothing better than the Jones Act, right? I mean, that is, a, that is an amazing piece of, of America first or America only um, legislation. So we, the, 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 the basis, the ground uh, starting point for this is not exactly uh, free trade. Is, is that right? And, and uh, where, where is the next Jones Act? Where should we look for it? Will there be a China Jones Act or some sort of equivalent elsewhere that could have equivalent uh, restrictive power? Well, I, I think uh, Jones Act could could have been drafted much more wisely, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but leave that. Uh, but I would say that Jones Act, in my eyes, is uh, is special. Uh, it's very special because it not only sort of uh, closes the the the, in, the internal market in the U.S. to foreign operators, but it also carries with it uh, some demands on you cannot just you cannot buy a ship abroad and and even though if you're an American company. So there are many sort of demands. It has to be American built, uh, American uh, operated, everything. But if you look at it just from outside in terms of market access, we have to be honest and say in, in terms of cabotage, trading internally, that's a challenge basically everywhere. There are very, very few completely open markets. Yeah. Now, Sven, you, you, uh, when we talk about international, the internationalism of this market, you sort of embody it as well as anybody because you're Norwegian, but you, uh, you, you uh, have worked in this global industry, you were active here, and you now uh, work for a Japanese uh, company and represent it uh, uh, at the ICS. So it, it's, uh, it's a sort of uh, uh, Mr. Globalization, um, can you give us your perspective? And also particularly, I'm interested to hear the, the perspective on China because that's such a crucial player. First of all, Daniel, thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, if you'll allow me, Daniel, I need all these topics today, the, they are interlinked. If you'll allow me just to make one observation, which was uh, I, I made earlier this morning under the three sessions. With all of the best intentions of everybody involved, we have an industry out there which is called bureaucracy, which is called politicians who are walking around in circles and I say again, with all the best intentions, whilst we, in the interest of the betterment of the world, of you and I as consumers, transporting the goods which we need. Now, to me, this is sim can simply not continue. If you make a comparison in what we're doing compared with the car industry, compared with loads of other industries, I mean, I was amazed to hear the final comment from Jeffrey, the United States representative, who says that, okay, we are going to impose, all these costs are gonna be covered by the ship owner. Now, I think the industry, as well as they have done over the years, and the politicians and the bureaucrats, be it the United, call it, call it the United Nations, be it, be it the EU, we have a duty to make us understand what this is all about. We take for granted that we, we surround ourselves with products which are shipped across the world. Why? Because Production has, over the years, been outsourced, certainly out of Europe. Mineral resources are spread around the world on this little globe of ours, where, which consists of roughly 80% water. And we, as consumers, we demand these products. Now, getting back to the bureaucrats and the politicians, the shipping community will comply with any rules and regulations which are enforced based on 
knowledge. Now, this, uh, this morning I heard we need the IT information, we need to get more information, technical details, etc., etc. Et this is not what it's all about. This is all about understanding what we as human beings need and what some have decided to focus on, namely transporting these goods for us. So I'm sorry, I think the mass media, politicians, bureaucrats, us in the business, we have a huge job to do to get people on board to understand. Now, so thank you for that, Daniel. And I don't think this is being done well enough. We are being driven by bureaucrats who are, I mean, the best example is the ballast water situation. It took 40 years, not because of the industry. The industry in those 40 years were trading their vessels. They were getting the goods from A to B around the world according to our consumer's interest. Let's be clear on this. This is what it's all about. We are giving a service which is there meant to be for the betterment of the world. That has got to be put in context. Now, as far as ICS, JSA, all us as ship owners are concerned, of course we are interested in fair trade. It's been there forever. However, at the moment there seems to be this focus on the United States as far as free trade is concerned. Germs Act has been there forever. It's been there as long as I've been in shipping, which is now more than 40 years. What nobody's talking about is the fact that the largest market at the moment, being China, they've already stated clearly that 50% of their imports, as well as their exports, is to be carried on Chinese ships. Now, there's nothing wrong in that, in a sense, because the shipping community will adapt, short of when we look at GDP growth on which our industry is based, let's face it, getting, drilling it down to us as consumers. That's not a problem as, as, as such. The, the issue is that when we don't consider this as an issue when, when lots of, I would say, opportunists go out and order vessels. That is the issue. So whilst we now seem to be talking about the United States, who, one, don't have the shipbuilding capacity, two, don't have the sufficient ships under American flag, and for the uninvited to build a ship, you know, it basic from planning to delivery takes two years. You know, we have in NYK, with some 800 vessels, we have an, uh, American flag vessels. We can all build American flag vessels. There is a building capacity shortage in the United States. So bringing it back, this back to realism, I mean, fine, we're all for open trade, but this threat of the current administration or a Democratic uh, senator saying we need to do such and such and such, I don't think it's, it's, it's too worrying. I say again, we're all for free, but it's not going but to are you? But if you're not worried about America, are you actually, what you're really saying, you are worried about China? No, I'm not saying I'm worried about China. What I'm saying is that China is in a completely different position. They have the shipyard capacity, they have the funds, they have the, the ability to do what they've said to do, namely carry 50% of their imports. But, uh, but and I'm curious to know whether, because there obviously the, there's, there's a global impact of China, but <coughs> for Japan specifically, sitting next door to China and mm -hmm. seeing China's rise and seeing China as it were, overtake Japan uh, as the second and soon to be the biggest economy in the world. <clears throat> is it something that, 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 that is a strategic and, and industry worry for, for Japan, this, this, this market power that China has? I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's a worry. It's a, I say it's a concern, which is slightly, a slightly lighter term. But nevertheless, it is what it is. The shipping community has always ma managed to adapt to various call it, rules and regulations once they appear, and they will continue to do so. Franz, your mm. take on all this, and, and particularly on the container um, side of things. Uh, well, it's uh, always containers I'm uh, thinking about, so most of the things I say might not apply to bulk or tankers, or it's a world outside my uh, perspective. Um, in principle, I think, well, whether free trade, less free trade, or less free trade, or whatever, uh, is relevant, but not decisive. It's, especially for containers, 
the products that we move, production is spread along the world, and production is increasingly uh, located in, in, in separate places, how do I say, uh, a fewer number of places where products are being produced. Uh, a simple thing, not being transported by container ship, at least not as a cargo, is a reefer container. Uh, it's built in China or in Chile. Uh, if you come back to the US <coughs> perspective, we have Trump who wants to build, bring back uh, the assembly of cars to the US. And I recently read a short article on it, which basically said only 10% of the value is the assembly of the car. 90% of the value in it are the components, and the components are produced anywhere in the world. Uh, regardless whether you bring back the assembly to the US, these components, they will not, or at least not for the major part, produce in the, U uh, in the US itself because it's too expensive, they don't have the knowledge, etc. Well, coming back to the Jones Act, I looked up some figures. Uh, Madsen, the local carrier, uh, charges you $2,500 per TEU. Uh, Abach Lloyd charges approximately $1,000, being on much larger distances. Uh, WCL, more into Far East focused, is $800. It's almost impossible. You can try to bring back production to the US, but it's impossible to compete in that way. Products will become very expensive for the American. Uh, I don't think they will like it. More important is, if you want to bring some, back something, is uh, have the right quality, have the right cost, either through automation or whatever, and you need your logistics chain to do it. If your logistics chain is too expensive, like in the case of intra-US, not a chance. What I think is, at least for containers, and we're now coming back to the perspective of GDP, uh, trade ratio. In containers, we carry a lot of goodies, I would call them, the nice things that mm. we want to have, some things that we need to have, also like food. But a lot of those things that we carry or used to carry, uh, they sort of become superfluous. Uh, I was thinking when I packed my stuff yesterday, 10 days ago, 10 years ago, I would take a I would have taken the telephone, uh, a calendar, uh, an iPod for some music, a book for some entertainment, uh, a notebook to uh, read my email. And so you can go on. Now this thing you have in just one simple smartphone, uh, it means that some of the trade is shifted from actual trading products to trading something in the air, bits and bytes, uh, you don't carry that. And that are, are you noticing uh, that there's two things, I think, happening here? One is, that, as you uh, absolutely rightly mentioned, that uh, the nature of what people are consuming is, 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 is changing, and there may be more uh, uh, services that are consumed and more bits and bytes rather than physical stuff, which is obviously has implications for, for the industry. Uh, but there's also a shortening, potentially, of supply chains uh, in the face of pot potential fears of protection protectionism and also worries about disruption of other sort, geopolitical risk and mm. so on. Are those things that you're, uh, that you're seeing having an impact on, on the container business? Uh, well, we have disruptions in the sense that you can, for example, the trading pattern can change. Like, for example, you have in, in China, in the, in the old days, all of the Chinese goodies were produced in the south of the country. Uh, since then, the south is in that respect rather growing because, growing because it's developing in a sort of mature economy. It's now moving north into the country, the Boharim area near, uh, near Korea. Uh, one day, that's becoming too developed, and it will move again. It will, might move to, I don't know, to Vietnam, to Indonesia, to, uh, like before that, we had everything made in Taiwan, everything made into Hong Kong. Maybe you can. 
it means that the actual starting points and destinations of cargoes may, uh, may change, but they still will come from somewhere. And if it's in the same region or further away. One more question first for you, and then we'll uh, move on. But on contain container business specifically, we've seen this consolidation of the industry, big players uh, merging. I'm curious uh, for your view on what's driving that uh, and um, what the implications are going to be for other competitors <coughs> and for the industry more broadly. Uh, what's driving it is, is money, or better, if they don't, they go bankrupt. You have the uh, quite well uh, governed companies like, like Messline, who's always making some sort of profit, MSC, the black box financially, but still they are doing well. Uh, you have the others on the other side, like, well, Hanjin recently went down because it, there was a hesitance of cooperation between Hyundai and Hanjin, the two compatriots. The, there are too many, or, well, there still are too many players in that market to be a consolidated market. There's too much competition. So there still could be, more, you expect more consolidation to, ha to happen. Is that what you're? Uh, we, uh, we wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, of course, we now have the co uh, three consolidations, the two consolidations to come, the three Japanese carriers, at least the container businesses. Uh, Hamburg suits being taken over by Messline, WCL <coughs> taken over by Costco group. Uh, actually, all five of them, they were too small to survive on their own. We've been wait, basically waiting for ages before the Japanese to announce they're working <laughs> together. They're in the same trading areas, they carry the same stuff, they have the same networks, they have a different owner. Uh, so it was no surprise that they came. Hamburg suit was quite specialized which might give them an advantage in the market, but uh, it's too difficult. Uh, so the, eventually they decided we cannot afford the investments that we need to remain competing about these giants, against these giants. Uh, so it's now it's the time to sell our property to somebody who pays good money for it. Well, <laughs> Messline paid quite well money for it, uh, then we had WCL, similar thing with that difference that it's not specialized <coughs> for its intra-far east, east-west trades. Uh, and they probably might be at least a show as being less eager to sell. But then we had Costco, of course, with uh, financially not doing that, ba uh, that well, but with a lot of money somewhere behind it. And they are willing to pay a huge price for the company of seven billion almost. Uh, so they gave in. Uh, there's now very few companies left in the middle. You have Hyundai, which is not doing so well, and the, chan the, the, the question is, will it be able to survive? Uh, we have Sim in between, which is definitely too small to survive on its own, or at least to survive in its current form. And below that, you go to the more specialized companies, which also always have, uh, all of them have a sort of their own niche, even if their own niche can be in the Far East. Or, uh, Good. Well, pl I, I, I get the conclusion from you that there is still plenty more uh, to still, come, that this trend has some, has, has, has some way to go. Henry, on, the, on, on your side of the, uh, of the business, um, the, the link between GDP is still presumably something you watch very uh, closely, so these general trading uh, trading trends have a huge impact for you, and the, the consolidation doesn't seem to have happened in quite the same way. Or there's still room for for, for, for for more players. Is that would that be fair? <clears throat> well, the first point, the uh, the link between GDP and trade growth, um, unlike containers, where we have seen a very big shift, as you as you rightly point out, um, we we still see a very strong correlation on both dry bulk and tankers between GDP and, uh, and, and trade growth. The, the difficulty there is the relationship really on the oil side is between oil demand and uh, GDP, whereas on the trade side, a lot of the oil demand is being satisfied more by LPG or NGLs, which move on gas ships, not on tankers. Uh, and that's certainly a trend we see going forwards. Um, the other thing that GDP doesn't give us any indication of, unless you 
narrow it down to where is the GDP, where's the fastest growth taking place, is, is what is the relationship between that country's growth and that country's ability to satisfy its own, its own raw material demand. Uh, and obviously that's one reason why if growth comes from China, uh, which relies very heavily on iron oil or, uh, or crude oil imports, then that's going to provide a multiple of GDP. Um, we've seen a trend, certainly, with the US uh, market, and let's just touch on that, that protectionism side. Um, we've seen some odd uh, trade benefits, uh, in some ways, from resurgence of US crude oil production. And that seems almost counterintuitive. Um, and obviously, one of the the protectionist measures mooted was, was uh, it's been dropped now, but the US uh, um, uh, Border um, uh, Act um, was to, to encourage or to disincentivize imports and to encourage exports. Um, that wouldn't have actually been such a bad thing for oil trades, because what, what that would have done probably is ultimately reduce the price of, of Brent, which makes, stimulates oil demand, and you probably find that oil demand would have emerged in countries that were further in trade terms from, from the US. So West Africa would have been exporting to, to China rather than to the US. So that could have been a beneficial. So we take a very pragmatic view when we see these you know, potential uh, protectionist uh, um, enforcements. Um, to the second point, why is consolidation not so obvious on the bulk side? Well, I, I think it is. Um, I, we have, I mean, there's, there's two markets in shipping, and certainly in bulk shipping. There's, a, there's an asset market where you get speculators who, who hope to sell a, a ship at a profit, and when you get a, a VLCC, the biggest you know, tanker going from 165 million to 75 million in, in a couple of years, you can see there's a lot of money to be made and lost in that market. Um, and then there's a, a trading market. There's, a, there's a, 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 an operational market where people try to make money out of, um, out of moving goods around the world, and the two aren't really related, uh, or in many ways it, uh, aren't related. So the consolidation has happened on the freight side. So we have a lot of commercial pooling on bulk markets, um, where all the, all the control, commercial control of the ships has been consolidated. Technical management is quite well consolidated. Um, an interesting development we're seeing at the moment is a, a much more active participation from the, the industrial players. Um, and we think one of the motivations behind this is this change in accounting rules that it hits the market in, 20, in 2019 where all assets that you had on time charter as a charterer uh, now come back onto your balance, balance sheets. And they're now competing for capital with everything else you might spend money on. Um, and that was one of the big incentives for the big uh, charterers of dry bulk and uh, you know, tanker tonnage to, to actively incentivize third party ownership. You take that incentive away, and now these big players who are users of transportation um, are actively incentivized to make sure that they benefit from the cost benefits of perhaps new technology. And if we're talking Shell or BP, who have a lot of a big long on LNG, you know, that's the sort of development we expect to see happening. More control shifting and, and probably more of the asset uh, ownership shifting towards the industrial players um, within the market. It's a very vivid example of the impact that regulatory change oh. can have on the structure of an industry and, and the, you know, how the, everything then adjusts to this rather big uh, shift in incentives. Do you, do you see other regulations? I know you've just had a panel this morning on regulatory, but do you see other uh, regulations that you're particularly got your eye on that have similar <coughs> impact? Um, I, I mean, the, 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 the um, SOX uh, cap um, is, is the biggest deal for us um, in that it raises the, the cost in theory for everybody. Um, and, uh, and so there are opportunities there for the refining industry to, to gain a margin by exploiting it or, or a, a ship owner to, uh, to save costs by exploiting it. Um, and so this is, and again, what, following on from that discussion this morning, the, the, the difficulty we have as an industry, I think, is, is going back to this, this lack of clarity. The idea that the target's been set too high as a goal, and then you eventually get there and realize that pragmatism must prevail and you have to shift the goalpost slightly. Now, we saw it a little bit on ballast water just in, in July where there was a, a little juggling because of the availability of the, of the kit, uh, the workable kit, uh, and naturally the ship owner will say, well, I don't think I want to install my scrubber because there might come to Jan 2020 when this, uh, you know, suddenly everything's pricing closer to diesel than it was to HFO. Uh, there, and there's availability issues because it's not there in the right place. Uh, th there might be some, uh, some exemptions, some, you know, as we discussed, uh, um, uh, that might cost the owner who's put that scrubber on board 
and suddenly his payback is, is not two years, it's five years or it's seven years. And now we're in a, in a carbon you know, emissions environment where a scrubber is not going to help anyway. So it's a very complex sort of uh, attitude towards, towards these, uh, these regulations. And I'm afraid that the bulk ship owning community, I can't speak for containerized trade, and I think there there is probably a, a benefit of being seen to do the right thing because you have a brand that you want to maintain. Bulk shipping, it's, it's a commodity. You, know, there's no, you don't get paid more for be, being a good player. You know, which is why the likes of Maersk have, have largely got out of, 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 uh, of, of tankers. It's, you know, what can they offer them, the market as, as being a, a very safe? You know, it's, all, it's all safe. The standards are very high. Um, but you don't get paid for doing something extra. Right. Uh, and so that, that's really what, uh, what, what motivates them. Now I want to go and uh, ask for your questions in a moment, but I, before I do that, I want to uh, give uh, the panelists here a chance to respond to anything that they've heard mm -hmm. uh, said just now by their fen fellow panelists, because we've gone sort of one, one on one, but I'd like you to have the chance just to sort of jump in there. So uh, do, you want to, do, you want, do you want to go first? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Franz mentioned the, the issue of globalized production and so on, and that reminds me that I had briefly mentioned that I sometimes feel the shipping industry is not sufficiently worried about the cost of bureaucracy, of border crossing times, of customs, of lack of transit. I mean, a lot of the work we do these days is on single windows, pre-arrival processing and so on, and, and sometimes the feeling the shipping industry arrives at the port, and of course they are unhappy if, if there are waiting times and so on, but but if the container and the cargo has to wait, I mean, you measure the loading, unloading in, in moves per minute or per hour or whatever, and then the container may stay weeks or months in the port. And, and this does hamper. This we see more and more as a real obstacle to trade. France mentioned a globalized production, and for, especially for this type of trade. Yeah, this is surely something the government should be worried about, because this is a fundament, fundamental thing of, of, of economic it policy. Is, it right? is the yeah. role of government, and, and uh, governments have last year or this year came and in, entered into force the WTO trade Station agreement, which I think is a very good thing. But some of the the shipping is we could push even more lobby, so, lobby so, so their is the shipping making. is the shipping industry not being good enough politically is what you're saying and or, or clear enough about what it's what its interests where its interests lie or maybe they are not always uh, aware of this enough that, that this okay. uh, if you see the long term because it's the, the question of this pen the linkage to GDP and trade and, and how can we promote trade and we see the obstacle to trade growth is increasingly the trade efficiency rather than the trade you costs. have to look at the whole ecosystem in other exactly who else wants to uh, leap in with anything? Have you been outraged by anything that you've heard? Well, well, I have. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, we, we see this all the time, and Jan, Jan's got a point. Uh, however, it brings me back to the issue of the bureaucrats and the politicians. You cannot expect. Um, let me give you a very clear example. We are, in NYK, we are probably the biggest maritime carrier of vehicles across the world. Um, part of the contracts which do, they are based on short lead time, you know, from port to port. That is what we control to a major degree. We are, our contracts are said, you will only get the business if you pay least and you get the, uh, get the vehicles from port of load to port of discharge in record time. This is also reference to what was said earlier this morning by the other uh, John related to the environmental side, right? So, one of my questions to one of the OEMs was at a stage, well, look, this is very, very interesting. How is it that you want us to transport these from A to B, and we have examples of your cars hanging around in ports for six weeks? Exactly. A tremendous problem. We. And here again, you know, as much as the bureaucrats are horse trading amongst themselves, I dare say that some of the customers do the same because they say, well, that's not our problem. We want you to transport and we're at the very, very end of the uh, end of the line when it comes to, you know, the logistics side is very, very end of the line. I'm not saying all customers are like this, but I'm saying that there are examples out there. And I'm also saying that for us as a service provider, to go and enforce or demand is extremely difficult. That can only be done through sound regulation, Absolutely. firm regulation, which we and our customers and the players uh, uh, in general need to follow. 
Okay, let's open it up. And uh, who would like to ask a question to our panel? <laughs> Down here and at the back there. But we'll go here first. Thank you. Simon Bennett from the International Chamber of Shipping. Um, I hesitate to ask this question, but looking to the future, do you think the big tech firms, um, Amazon, Uber, do you see a possibility of them intruding in the shipping industry whereby we become gov you know, governed by algorithms? Well, I'd love to answer that question. Um, it's, I'm sorry, it's similar to a question I was asked years back, uh, will China ever produce cars? <laughs> There was people were adamant saying, no, it's not going to happen. Well, at the time, they produced 98% of all flat screen televisions in the world, which is 80,000 weldings. And is there any reason with 32,000 you know, parts for a car that they should not be able to assemble them when most of those products are produced in China? Uber, yes. I mean, it's very clear to me that, that the, the shipping industry, we are pretty old fashioned, right? <laughs> I say again, with no disrespect to all the, the, you know, the push and what is done by individuals as well as organizations. There's, there's a lot of good work being done. But from an, from an IT perspective, you know, we're slow. From, you know, that others will come in and try to, you know, do things in our business. They've done it everywhere else. Why wouldn't they do it in our industry? I so so what could time. you imagine the tech, the big tech, I mean, there's two t different things perhaps here. One is a big tech company coming in and being a disruptor. Mm. The other would be some sort of other tech disruption from innovation of some sort, which wouldn't necessarily have to come from the, uh, the, 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 the giants of the tech Auton industry. Could autonomous come vessels. From, autonomous vessels. I mean, the, the, we were talking earlier on that perhaps the biggest last disruption in the, uh, in the industry was containerization, but that's now um, you know decades old. So uh, it's it's like you're slightly anomalous. It strikes me as an industry to have uh, come this far without being majorly disrupted. So what is well, perhaps? We but I, I think uh, uh, the the question raised by Simon here, I think that's really one of the very very important questions, uh, and I think that we should be careful, everyone of us within the shipping industry as a whole not to just wait for Uber, Amazon, and <laughs> others to come in, but actually ask ourselves, how are we going to embrace technology so that we actually will adapt? Because if you look at all the others, uh, other sectors, business sectors, those big companies that were saying, say, no, 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 this is, uh, we can wait, uh, they were simply taking over. But doesn't it, so, I mean, so I, I, would I, say, no, I would say that the big challenge we have, and Swain was uh, addressing it actually, is that we are simply too slow to embrace new technology. Mm -hmm. If you look at just how we are operating ships, for instance, we have put information technology into the ships, but we are basically operating them in the same way as we did 100 years ago, That's except exactly. that now we have an engine, not a sail. Mm -hmm. We spent, we have much more written mandatory <laughs> regulation stipulating how people are going to be trained using a sextant. Mm -hmm. There's not one mandatory word stipulating anything how people are going to handle information technology and cybersecurity. Yeah. That's in 2010. So how about just you know a venture capital fund for the shipping industry that goes out to Silicon Valley and say, here I see, I've been sitting here listening to you all complaining about the uh, you know the terrible delays that are beyond your controls. Shouldn't you be taking the initiative and say, come on, we need technological solutions to this and let's take it. Let's have some startups that address this. Are you looking? Uh, no. I don't know who. <laughs> I, I don't know who the I, budding Mark, book, I, I, Mark Zuckerberg is among. Yeah, you, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. if I may just say, the the speed of development here is definitely exponential. Right. One year ago, it was big news that we launched digital certificates. Right. Now everybody's talking about autonomous ships. Right. So and we see companies, Rolls Royce, others are launching uh, news about how far they have come. We already have in Denmark a commercial operated remote control vessel. So things are moving very, very quick. In the ship broking business, you're already being disrupted <laughs> rather more, aren't you? Is, or, or is that is that excuse me. Is that a oh, fair yeah, is I that mean, a fair is that a fair comment? It's, um, uh, you know, I I information is is what technology is providing. We were at one point in time information providers. You want to know where a ship was, you call a ship broker and they tell you where the ship was and what it wanted to do. 
I mean, that is a long time ago since a shipbroker was needed for that. It's now shipbroking is a, is a service. Um, and a lot of the, the information gathering process is now done by, uh, by, by technology, by AIS uh, information um, or, or, or port lineup information that's fed you know, very quickly around the world. So, you know, it's a threat to the shipbroking model, and, you know, the big shipbroking firms are thinking very hard about how to respond to that threat, there's no doubt about it. Uh, we've got examples like BHP who have set up transactional platforms that are motivated by uh, a, a, a wish to you know, simplify the, the back office procedure to, to create uh, greater efficiency, but in the process, a commission doesn't drop out the end for a broker. So that's, that's the sort of thing that could well, could well happen, could well move beyond um, you know, charters that operate in, in, in the same way that BHP does. There's another side to the technology that I think is, is, is quite interesting from the way the oil trading market works as well. Um, a lot of oil is moved around the world not by the big industrial players, Shell BP, but by oil traders who see a, a, an advantage of buying crude oil or refined products in one place and selling it in another place. Now, that advantage is, exists because there's asymmetry of information. We don't know exactly what's being discharged there or, or, or what's being bought there. There's just not enough information around. And of course, traders are, are working very hard to prevent that information getting out there because mm -hmm. that, that's their business model. Precisely. And I think that's one of the reasons we, I would suspect that as technology starts to, it, it is inevitable, as, as you say, you know, it's happening already and, and the progression is, is inevitable, um, that we do not, that we start to see even bulk shipping move into more a, a, a logistics business rather than a, a trading business. Yep. Right. Sorry, I wanted yeah, to bring sorry, in, sorry. you were waiting to come in. Right? Yeah. Uh, the question is maybe not so much uh, whether these companies like uh, you just mentioned step in and do something revolutionary in the shipping business, but uh, the question is, shouldn't shipping companies itself start searching for that? We had, for example, recently you had Messline, which is usually quite well organized, which was very much focused on uh, digitalization, automation in its company uh, as a sort of a novelty, or at least they considered themselves a sort of a novelty in their business. But then just a simple virus pulled the whole company down and it costed hundreds of millions of US dollars. And can you imagine how that is with the rest of the companies? Yeah. Which are less organized. So no, I can, you know, to, to quote uh, John of this morning, I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here with, with, with John Adams, that is, uh, you know, of sitting here with various hats, uh, JSA being one, NYK being one, and, uh, you know, various other hats. Uh, one being the personal one as well, but uh, as my comments being as such. But I can tell you in, in the R system and in, I think it's partly done by our, uh, call it Japanese competitors as well, there is working being done on the, the such issues. We are testing out autonomous vessels. We are looking at platforms, you know, transferring that data from, from, call it from ship to shore. Um, all this is in progress. Um, I say again, we are probably way behind the, call it the technological companies, um, uh, which are, well, are obviously far advanced and running lots of what we're doing today. But there is work underway. Um, but I'd say again that you need to be a sizable company because to be able to do this, and you need to have a strategy and funding to do this because it's not inexpensive. Well, I would say on behalf of the shipping industry that you uh, ought to be uh, a little bit offended if the tech companies don't take an interest in you mm. because you ought to be interesting enough for, for them. There was, there, was, there was one at the back there, first of all, yes, and then I'll come to you next. Is it on? Yes, there we go. We Chris Horton now. speaking yeah. independently. Um, just, just slightly concerned uh, about Mr. Stymier's uh, political rhetoric um, because there seems to be a move that all bureaucracy and politicians are necessarily an, an evil thing and a bad thing. And we, we had that coming through, you know, I'm surprised we didn't actually hear the word fake news. No. Um, <laughs> but the, the, there was this sense that um, everything they do must be inherently uh, anti-industry. And, and then at the same time, um, there was also an argument that we need firmer regulation. So there's a dichotomy there because 
clearly firmer regulations are made by bureaucrats. So some bureaucrats are going to have to make the firm regulations. So are we against them or for them is the question, I suppose. And, and the main underpinning question about that is that if we don't like, and we live within a democratic system largely, and if we don't like what the bureaucrats and politicians are doing, then surely there are ways democratically in which we can change that. Swain, I think we come to you on that since you're... No, I don't find that question at all, and I appreciate the question. It's uh, highly appropriate. But when we hear, as you heard this morning, that it took 40 years to implement a ballast water system, to me, there's something wrong in that system. We have no, as the shipping industry, we have no problems if the technology is there to implement it quickly. There was another comment this morning. We are, as far as greenhouse gases are concerned, you know, we, we're all concerned about this little globe of ours. I have grandchildren as well. I want them to live in a healthy world. I want to contribute to the betterment of this world from, from an environmental point of view as well. But if bureaucrats and politicians do horse trading amongst themselves, and I apologize, it might, to me it seems that way, one department not speaking to the other one and with, with different interests, and not to say, I mean, we've just had elections in Norway and fantastic arguments throughout the, throughout the year. We've had, you know, the point I'm trying to make is that there's a timeline there which we, in the interest, us as human beings, need to shorten. That is the whole point. I don't mind regulation. I'm not holier than the Pope. I, if I'm told to drive at 80 miles an hour, I will do my utmost if I have lots of time that day to stick to that, to stick to that, uh, that, that speed limit. Uh, I say again, I'm not holier than the Pope, and I dare say the industry will do this as well if the, if the reasons, and call it the, the law, is based on know-how, not ignorance. And I dare say that to some degree, and I'm sorry, my people might be offended, but some of what comes out at times is pretty much based on ignorance, and there we have a job to do. We need to bring up the level of know-how. Andreas, as a government representative yeah, here, I think you have, you, 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 you deserve yeah. the microphone. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Chris, for bringing uh, this question up. Um, I, I think that it's important that we remember that in a policy perspective and a regulatory perspective, the shipping, international shipping industry is a fantastic success. We have actually managed to make a completely international set of regulation. It's actually possible to be completely global in your company structure, in the way you operate. You can, you can hire people internationally, and, and you know wherever you go, basically, it's the same set of regulation. That is a huge achievement. Hmm. And remember, we are sitting, when we are negotiating this, we are more than 100 countries that has to, to agree. And so I, I, on the one side, I understand what you're saying, say, but it has to be based on know-how. Okay, we are 137 countries that has to first agree what is know-how. But that's just how the way it, it, it works. So sometimes it takes time, actually, to reach into agreement. But don't forget that when we have reached an agreement within the maritime sector, we are, I would say, we are very, very good performing. Just mm -hmm. think about the problems we had 30 <coughs> years ago. <laughs> Substandard shipping, people having completely unacceptable working conditions, uh, huge, huge concerns, safety-wise, environmental-wise, and look at it today. That's where international regulation has brought us. So I totally agree on, you know, I, I love bureaucracy as long as it do not get bureaucratic. <laughs> Can I just so, ask, yeah. ask I, uh, I think that was an excellent defense, brilliant defense, <laughs> of, defense of bureaucracy. Jan, um, there's also, I mean, to pick up the information point, because, you know, your information, your in, in, institution um, produces a lot of this stuff. It's not just uh, the media, it's, it's uh, international bodies that also have a responsibility to feed good information that presumably is designed, above all, for ultimate policy, good policy making. Mm -hmm. Uh, how would you describe the state of play in, 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 in information on the complex, as we've heard, very complex issues that the shipping industry uh, faces? Is it, are we in an information-rich or an information-inadequate 
state of affairs? Good question. Oh, good, good question. I hadn't really prepared for this, but I, it, I, I would very much want to support uh, An Andrea's perspective there. Glass can be half full, half empty. Uh, and, and I, I mentioned earlier this morning, I used to work for the IMO Secretariat. And, and it is actually quite positive of what, what has been achieved so far. But at the same time, it is also true that very often we feel that the information on which decisions are based is insufficient. It's a lot of, I mean, we all have to work together. My terms of reference paid for, my, my salary is paid by your taxes, thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I'm, I'm asked actually to do capacity building information for our member countries. So, so that's a point very well taken. So and you, you partly work. have to identify the gaps, yeah, right? Exactly, right, exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah. And a lot of the work we do, and again, that's what I, I tried to share earlier, we feel one of the key gaps these days is actually on trade efficiency and not so much on the amount of duty, which is discussed more often, also in The Economist, as compared to trade efficiency. But, so that's the type of thing we do. And, and uh, a lot of uh, yeah, our members, our clients, they contract us to do this type of training, research, gap, ana gap analysis very much is, is the work uh, we do there. The linkages to GDP, trade. Uh, I did have this little note here at the, the starting point question here was this GDP trade linkage and, and we used to say GDP or trade grew two to three times faster than GDP over many decades um, and this has now gone down and there's a lot of discussion do we have a new paradigm is it, that, that's the type of research we do also at UNCTAD together with World Bank WTO IMF there. is there something new and, and there are different opinions there my personal view looking at the data and regressions and correlations is actually we do not have a new paradigm. It is still the same statistical correlation. It is just that trade has started to grow slower. And in previous periods where we had trade growth that was that slow, like early 80s, we also had trade, sorry, GDP growing that, that low. We also had trade <coughs> growing below GDP. But the, it's, it's an open question. I, I'm going to You need more we, data we, points, in we fact. We need more okay. data. There's a lot of what, what yes. we do, and we, I will continue to read The Economist to see the answer. Okay. So <laughs> we, it's the first time in 50 years that we have four years in a row that trade has grown slower than GDP. So there is something new there. There's something different. And yeah, I still have 13 years until my retirement, so I keep working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, here. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. Gabriel Fuentes, War Maritime University. Uh, my question goes related with some of the topics we've been discussing and will be connected a little bit with what we talk in the morning about CO2 emissions as well. And uh, you brought a really important uh, term, trading efficiencies, and that we are trading as the same as we've been trading the last hundred years. The fact that should we take more of that liberalization that we have at uh, what we want to have in a free trade environment, can we have more of that in the, in the private sector? Shipping companies working together with ports, sharing more information. I know there's a big concern of uh, business secrecy, but the thing is that statistics tells already we are following 80% of uh, schedule reliability, at, at least that's just in the container sector. If we are moving 90% of the cargo, and most of that is unreliable, you have suboptimal results at the moment you're going to keep your trading uh, if you want to have your trade efficiently as possible. So do you think there's a kind of responsibility from the private shipping sector? And if, the, if this could be improved in terms of by, by connecting uh, the stakeholders closer? You want to come to that? Huh? There's, um, there can be a serious problem in sharing information. And well, my neighbor can certainly reply on that. Uh, authorities, or they have, they're dead scared for authorities. Uh, recently in the US, the Department of Justice, it was, I think, raided ship owners, ship carriers, I should say, coming together uh, with a sort of, uh, on a sort of collusion, collusion yeah. problem. And the Japanese withdrew from all the conferences because they did not dare to run the risk of being accused of collusion. Uh, a lot of the uh, row row guys have been uh, charged or fined by the various South Africa, Australia, I think, US. Uh, so I don't think there will many companies will be very eager to share information, uh, certainly not informally, uh, sorry, formally. 
no info. Um, another thing about what just uh, occurred to me, we were talking about this competition between companies and they had to go together, etc. One of the reasons, be besides the crisis, the financial crisis in container shipping, is the visibility of information. In this case, I'm talking about the spot rates as provided by the Shanghai uh, Container Freight Index or, or its competitors. Everybody basically nowadays knows what shipping companies charge, at least for spot cargo. Uh, and in the, in the previous time, in the older days, it was that shippers had contracts with the carriers fixed prices, or sort of, my neighbor can tell. And the spot rates was the exception. Nowadays, you have the contracts where there's a fixed price and immediately a clause that is linked to the spot rate. So uh, I think this, this, this whole question uh, relates also to what, Henry, you were talking about, which was this sort of move towards transparency. Uh, and there may be some resistance to it, as you say, there may be nervousness about it, but that seems to be the way that the world is moving, is it not? <coughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I would argue. I mean, I, I, I'm not a container expert. I, I just, one of the comments on that relationship between GDP, it seems pretty obvious to me that you've gone through some major phases within, you know, production, let's say. Um, we've been through a phase of exporting the manufacturing base from OECD to non-OECD mm. and then re-importing the finished or part finished goods. That was clearly a phase where containerized trade grew very rapidly. Uh, then we've moved to a phase where a lot of the GDP growth that was adding to that global figure was coming from those developing countries who were consuming a lot of those finished or part finished goods domestically, which is going to result in lower finished or part finished uh, containerized trade exports. Now we're entering a phase and, and I think I've read this in your publication, where a lot of that production through technological changes is being done in OECD countries. So you've got uh, you know, different printing techniques and uh, yep. the, 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 you know, whatever happens is perhaps coming back to the beginning of the discussion, whatever happens in terms of trade protection, it's probably inevitable that a lot of that trade in finished goods, the raw material trade, you know, I think has, has got some longevity, but the trade in finishing goods finished goods, that, that has, um, th that's at risk, from, from where I sit. I'm not a containerized, containerized trade expert, but that would be my, my observation. Yeah, I think these may have to be the last two questions, but we, perhaps we'll take them both um, together and then, and then give uh, panelists a chance to answer. Yeah. Um, Neville Smith, Bryn Mariner Communications. Henry, I was interested to know your thoughts on, um, it's more of a shipping question than a trade one, but what do you do about the risk between the dusk and the dawn, which is shipyard capacity and ship owners' inability to restrain themselves from ordering more ships, because at the moment, in an improved, generally improving shipping markets, we seem to be okay, but we've got much too much shipyard capacity uh, for the growth of trade level, which could actually capsize this quite quickly. I think I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, you're comparing a market, you know, today where you could order a, you know, a ship of pretty much any type and have it delivered within within a you know a year and a half, two years. Um, you know, that can flatten the spike pretty quickly uh, compared to, you know, 2004, 2008, you'd have to wait five years for your vessel. So, so in that period, you could have some sustained high income for, for, uh, until yards had the ability to, uh, to supply the tonnage to, um, to, 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 to add to the, the supply side. So, so now, yeah, there's, a, there's a, very real, a very real possibility that a lot of those, a lot of that volatility that we've seen, particularly in the asset curves, um, you know, you, you'll get the volatility, but it'll be much shorter lived because now we have the ability to produce that supply to cover it. And yeah, yeah you, you, you could argue that, um, you know, because the only, the cheapest provider of tonnage at the moment is China, there's not much, not much uh, evidence to me that those costs are going to go down in China. Labor costs are going up, steel costs are going up. Um, so they won't have much legroom to reduce their cost further. There's nobody waiting in the wings that I know of that can produce the sort of volume of ships that China can produce. So there is an argument that says that at that new building price, even the low new building price today, you could not justify an order if, if, unless you see some real volatility in, in, in the market. You know, if it's just the, the sort of long-term time charter rates that we're looking at, you would not be able to justify a new building um, at today's very low prices based on that market. And so I think, you know, if you remove that real volatility, you're starting to change the paradigm of the industry. 
Question behind you. Thank you very much. Nicola Price Roberts from Southampton Solent University. Last week, I spent three days at the Logistics Research Network conference, uh, which we hosted at the university. And there were some very interesting um, papers on research that is being carried out about the future. And one of the things that came out is what Henry has just said. Um, the, the predictions, the, the research that's being done now for the logisticians is that there will be very much um, manufacturing coming back to OECD countries because of the rise in 3D and something that was completely new to me, 4D printing. <laughs> Okay. Do you know what that is? Yes, I, 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 of, of course I'm a good academic. I looked mm. it up afterwards. Mm. Um, 4D printing is 3D printing, and the thing that is printed can subsequently in time change its form. Mm. Okay. <laughs> a little bit too Star Trek for me to explain any further. It's a bit like a panel discussion on a, 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 a program, <laughs> that it's printed on the program and then it changes its form as you go along, right? Yeah, so I, 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 uh, yeah. I, think, I think what Henry said is, is right in terms of um, some of the, the shift in trade. What was also interesting um, was there was research, there was some papers done, and I refer you all, not that I have any vested interest, into Professor John Mangan at Newcastle University. He's looking at the link, or the break, the apparent break in the link between trade and GDP. And the tentative findings are that it's due to growth in services, service provision, which comes back to Fran's point that actually it's quite difficult to quantify some of the bits and bytes and the services that are actually being provided. Mm. And they, they predict, but of course these are economists and mm. if you get two in a room you'll get three opinions, but mm. they predict that that can only grow, that gap mm. is going to continue and is possibly going to even widen. So we can't rely on that anymore as an indicator of uh, shipping demand and freight rates. Thank you. Very, very interesting comment. I, 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 because you end on this fascinating thing of prediction, I think for the final round, and I, you can use this as part of your Daniel. pit, but, but, but come, in, come in very briefly on this and then we'll... Thank you, Daniel. As much, uh, in my opinion, as much as the container was the re revolution of the last century, as far as transportation is concerned, my view is that 3 and 4D printing is the revolu going to be the revolution of this century. I am absolutely convinced about it. Will that have an impact on our trade? Yes, if you look at everything which was put into our containers, which is currently, most of it currently being produced in China, moving sl gradually into Vietnam, Cambodia, I agree with you, it will come back to OECD, but in a different manner than what was the case in the, of the past. I'd like to respond to your question, uh, the, the, the second to last question being this of, uh, you know, cheap, uh, cheap, call it prices, low, low for going out to contract vessels. The industry has a challenge when banks, banks mm -hmm. themselves go out and contract vessels with no means other than wanting to take a profit once that sh the market picks up again and they can turn that ship around. Contrary to an industrial carrier which has been around for 131 years, together with our, our other 123 ship owners in Japan, the island, this island, the United Kingdom, which is completely dependent on shipping, that to me is a serious concern. And lastly, when it comes to cooperation, yes, we would, of course, I would encourage cooperation. That brings me back to bureaucracy and politicians again, because we are simply not allowed. I do not want to trade our ships around the world half filled with hot air. That is environmentally unfriendly and it is inefficient. I would like to be able to fill every ship of mine with cargo for the benefit of you and I as consumers and end users of, 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 of the products we, we buy. Thank you, Sven. I'll take that as your concluding marks. I want to give each of the other panelists literally no more than 30 seconds because we're, we're uh, near the end of our, <coughs> of our time. I'll start at the other end with you, Henry. And if, if you want to take up this 
predictive theme, that would be very welcome as well. Your prediction uh, for, uh, let's say, the next uh, 10 years, what is the thing that you see coming down the road uh, related to our discussion? Um, I've got, I got a couple of young kids um, who go to birthday parties, and every birthday party they get uh, 20 or 30 Lego boxes or something else, plastic, um, that presumably is shipped by container. Uh, my prediction is that the world wakes up and realizes that they don't need it and, uh, and will start spending money on sensible stuff. Digital Lego, Lego perhaps. Digital Lego, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we've, been, we've seen very high growth rates for container shipping for years. Then, we, of course, we had a crisis and then it picked up at slightly lower rates. Um, I don't think we'll see those big trades go back again, partly because of 3D printing, partly because of selling bits and bytes, and of course, uh, finally, a big part of what can be shipped in containers has already been transferred, and there's a limit to, uh, to how much can still go into boxes. I have no doubt that the digitalization will uh, now come into play in, uh, to a very large extent in the next <coughs> decade. It will change the way that we operate, uh, both commercially and, uh, and also in day-to-day -day business on board ships uh, and in the whole maritime logistic chain. Uh, I think also 3D printing can might change the trade patterns, uh, only future will tell. I do, however, firmly believe that uh, we will still see a lot of maritime activities. Mm -hmm. I think that we we'll still will see goods be, be, be moved around uh, continents. And I also think that we're going to see ocean activities that we have never dreamt of, because we will still need raw material. We will still need biological material, fish, <coughs> farm products, and, that's, and, and we need to move into the oceans. Deep and sea mining. Deep sea mining, and, and that's just the beginning of it, I think. So, and, and that leads to, to my final remark that I think we live in a time where cooperation, dialogue, even though it's also among bureaucrats, but bureaucrats and industry together to find the sustainable solution because I think that we, we, we need to embrace everyone and, and continue to work. And that is the way that diplomats work is actually to create mutual understanding to find the best way forward. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. A uh, very interesting uh, panel. Yeah, we discussed about free trade in goods, free trade in services. I tried to bring in the trade efficiency. One dimension we haven't really discussed and for the last thoughts you had mentioned in your earlier question, the consolidation, there were larger ships, the mergers. The, the free trade in years or decades to come could also be threatened by the market structure. If we have more and more consolidation, and although now it's, it has been in the press uh, for the main east-west lines and so on, but, but we already see it for the small island development states. Uh, we, we have data that shows that whereas 10 years, 15 years ago, there were two, three, four providers competing to provide services to Fiji or Solomon Islands or these. Today, there are one or two, and, and this is also a threat to free trade and shipping. Well, thank you very much. I think that's been a fascinating discussion. I take away... Uh, perhaps very crudely summarized three C's from this, uh, this conversation. Uh, the first is complexity. I think you've all demonstrated how this is a very uh, uh, complex ecosystem that we're talking about and, and uh, not just what happens in the ships but what happens on the shore, what happens in different uh, uh, elements of the shipping industry and, and then you have the, the whole dimension of government policy and bureaucratic uh, regula regulation. So it's, it's an incredibly uh, varied scene, and you've helped us, to use the shipping metaphor, navigate through it, I think, very ably. Second C is compliant. It seems to me that the, we've heard again and again that the, sh the industry gets on with whatever it is thrown at it. We've been amazingly resilient down the, down the centuries as a result of, of that, and I see no reason why that shouldn't be uh, continue to be the case. Um, but the third C is, is complacency, and that is, I think, um, what I conclude that the industry has to guard against, uh, that, that, that a lot is going, the one thing that you can be sure about is that a lot of change is coming uh, the way that will affect all these things. We, we've, we've, had a politic, we've had political shocks, which people seem relatively relaxed about, but there will be other shocks and there will be technological shocks too. And it seems to me that the last thing the industry needs, and I'm not accusing any of the panelists of this, of course, I think you've all shown an awareness that, that uh, 
that the future is going to look very different and that uh, complacency is, is not an option. So with that, thank you all very much indeed. And we now go to a break, which is well earned, and I'm sure the conversation with, will continue. But thanks to all our, our excellent panelists. Thank you.